Hey there and welcome to this video podcast, which is actually a joint video podcast today for Go Classics Magazine and of course, Brown Car Guy. I'm Shazad Sheikh, aka The Brown Car Guy, and as well as being a motoring journalist and content creator for over three decades, I'm also the media editor and a columnist for Go Classics. And if you haven't checked it out yet, here it is. Issue three is now out. It's brilliant. It's absolutely packed full of amazing content. And if you want to, if you want to find out what's in it, I've done a video on the content on this channel, so you can check it out. I'll put the link Somewhere up here, or it'll be in the description below, one way or another, you'll find the description. Anyway, you can head over to goclassics.co.uk, where you can buy a copy, print or digital. Digital, you could download it now. You could read it now on your phone or your tablet. But don't do it now. Do it after this podcast. Because joining me today, I've got a very special guest. He's also a very dear friend of mine who I know from back in Dubai. Uh, Matthias is founder and current chairman of the Concourse of Elegance in Switzerland. He's also known for launching the Quail, which is a motorsports concourse in California and annually showcases over 150 extraordinary classic racing cars. We're going to ask him all about that. But my most abiding memory of Matthias is that one time when we were supposed to meet up in the middle of the desert. I think it was for a shoot or something like that. So I'm standing there waiting for him. I'm staring down this beautiful, pristine piece of black tarmac that is just stretching out arrow straight between the dunes like absolutely clear and straight there's nothing on it and I'm waiting for him and eventually I can hear an engine approaching it's definitely approaching and it's coming quickly but I still can't see him that's because I was looking in the wrong place because ever the maverick and always choosing his own path this guy in his classic Range Rover was sure enough racing towards us, but not on the road. He was parallel to the road in the sand, and he was grinning so widely that I could see his pearly whites from over a quarter of a kilometer away. <laughs> welcome, welcome, Matthias. So wonderful to see you again after all this time, man. How you doing? Thank you, Shazad. Exactly. What a great memory. I love you described it. I could live it again. I could feel <laughs> another heat. And the sheer fun of taking a different road to yeah. meet the point. One of the beauties, actually, of, the, of that area is you can do it. Yeah, you can. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, you remember that, right? You absolutely remember that, yeah? And I remember, what did you say when you arrived? I said, why are you using the road? Why are you using the sand? And what was it you said? You said, you, said you can go fast on the road, but... I can go anywhere. That's it! <laughs> That was amazing, yeah. So it's, before, you know what? Before we get into all of this other stuff, that Range Rover, that was yeah. something of a special find, wasn't it? That was a very special find indeed. Well, I'm, I've always had a, a special eye and a, and a keen collector for Range Rovers, the classic one. And um, having landed in Dubai, I, I thought to myself, no, I'm not going to buy a new car. I'm going to find a classic Range Rover because I need a car to go off-road to go anywhere. And as I was shopping around, a, a Lebanese friend of mine who worked for Altair um, said to me, Matthias, I think... So just I to let people know, Altair is the official dealer in uh, UAE, uh, Dubai and Northern Emirates for Land Rover, Jaguar and Ford products. Right. And he said, come on, I've got, I've got to show you a car. I've got to show you a car. You like Range Rover. So we go in the back and I see this very, very nice green classic 1986 Range Rover. And I tell him, and I say, Fadi, this is a car for sale. This is my car. I would love to buy this car. And he said, no, maybe you cannot buy it because this car is owned by one of the sheikh. Uh, a sheikh is, as you know, one of the, the ruler or ruling family of, of the Emirate. And um, he, this one is not for sale, but I might have another one. So the car I was looking at was very good looking. It had about 120,000 kilometers on the clock, uh, which was very little for an 86 Range Rover. And I said, okay, fair enough. And then he calls me back a month later. So hang on a minute. What did you just say? How many miles did it have? 120,000 kilometers. It's about right. 65,000 miles. Oh, for an 86 Range Rover. For an 86 yeah. Range Rover. Okay. Yeah. Which was, you know, very low to our yeah. European standards. Um, but, but, you know, it, it was what it was. And I wanted the car. And I, was, I would have bought it even if it had 200,000. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And um and being a Sheikh's car was pristine, it was well looked after, yeah. so it was yeah. It was, it was very nice. But then he calls me back and he says, But yes, I've got a I've got to show you something. Just came in. So I walked back into the shop and here is another Cypress Green Range Rover four door. Um it was it was a Vogue, um eighty six as well, automatic transmission, EFI. So it was one of the early EFIs. Sorry, did I say eighty six? That second one was eighty eight. Right, okay. 
the first one was 86. And he shows it to me. And the car looks very nice, very detailed. And I look under the car and I see some markings, you know, on the mm-hmm. suspension and the, the axle. You know, the markings that you see from the factory when the car's brand new. Just as it's come off the production line. Yeah, and I think yeah. to myself, this is this is strange. Why would yeah. this, did they change all the axles? Yeah, yeah. It turned out the car had 5,000 kilometers. Okay, now we're putting it into context. So we're talking about what, 120,000 kilometers, 5,000 kilometers on a 1988 car. And this was what year when you found this car? 2009. 2009. So it, it, it was that about 20 years later. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mean, we've seen this before, you know, cars tend to have this magical thing that, you know, to increase their value, people make them go backwards. Yeah. Ferris <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bueller's day off. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Very, very inspiring. And so I said to him, I said, no, 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 this car doesn't have 5,000, although I saw the paint marks. And I, and I thought to myself, well, let me check. So I started lifting all the carpets. And what I found, you know, when a car's being used, there is dust, there is, there is dirt, there is... Yeah, of course, things, yeah. You know, especially an off-roader. Especially, yeah, especially. Yeah. And even if they haven't been off-road in that area and, yeah. and whatnot, it doesn't matter. There's always a bit of rust. There's always yeah. a few things. That car was brand new. Brand wow. new. Brand new. And so basically, I told him, I said, okay, it's a great car, but it's probably all the, the, the joints have to be changed. You know, the... the, the so, so we did a bit of work on it to make it uh, work so that it doesn't leak all its oil from the first go. Um, but there you go. That's how this. Well, how but leaking oil is just a ran- Range Rover thing, though, isn't it? Don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't go there. He's like, don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> but then, but tell me though, going back to that Range Rover. So, what was the story? How comes it had so little miles on it? Well, very simple. Um, the Sheikh, uh, who happens to be one of the brothers of Sheikh Mohammed, uh, the ruler uh, of Dubai, had. I think he told me he had. They had bought four identical cars um the green ones because he liked the green ones but basically he had bought four this is what fadi told me i don't know if the story is true but it's nice to hear um because he thought well if one breaks down i always have another one to drive <laughs> that's not such a uh, that is such a gcc thing to do oh, let's be honest we yeah. 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 <laughs> so he was not very trusting the reliability of land rover right? <laughs> <laughs> This, this is like the ultimate solution for the reliability issues for Range Rover fans and Land Rover fans. It's like, yeah, okay, we're not going to fix it. We're just going to buy more of them. No yeah. more. <laughs> I, guess, I guess he only bought one Toyota, but he bought four Land Rovers. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. And oh, so, my God. So, and then, so what happened to that car then? It never got driven because the others were actually yeah. more reliable than, than yeah. he thought. <laughs> and uh, and they never got driven, just the yeah. very min- minimal. And yeah. um, they decided to make room in the garages. Um, and so they just sold the cars. And that's it. maybe they've kept some. I have no idea. But they sold some of these. And that was part of the lot. Right. It was a true honor uh, to actually own a car that had been in, in royalty hands. Exactly, uh, yeah. Had a, a specific number on the on the door, on the B, uh, on the B pillar, uh, which is the registration number within the Sheikh's collection wow. uh, of the car. You know, it was, yeah. the number was there. So, so it was very special. Very, yeah. very special. How long did you run that car for? I've kept it uh, until 2015, I think. Uh-huh. Um, and then what happened was a bit of a mistake. There was a misunderstanding between me and a friend of mine. When I left Dubai to take another uh, job opportunity here in Europe, I kept the car and yeah. I thought, yeah, I'll ship it back later because I had to go quite right. uh, quite rapidly because the job was starting. And a friend of mine, you probably remember him, Arif, mm-hmm. um, offered to keep the car. So I said, oh, yeah, please keep the car. Yeah. And he kept the car. And I don't know, for some reason, somehow, uh, he sold it. All right. <laughs> On my I got the money. It's not the issue, but but I mean, the thing is, like, w- but he was he was he was Land Rover's owners' club, wasn't he in the UAE? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. So so clearly, in any case, it would have gone to a good home because it would have, it would be in that network, right? Do you want another story? <laughs> How much of it can you tell? <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know to whom he sold it, but he sold it to somebody, and somehow that owner or the successive owners were very wrong. Oh, and no. On them, publicly shame on them. Oh, like, no. You remember Faisal, Faisal Al-Salawi? No, Faisal I don't think Al-Salawi so. He used to work at, at uh, the Gas Marina. 
one day FaceTime oh. writes to me and he says, Matthias, is this your car? The car abandoned on a, on a police lot. Oh, no. Totally. Tires flat. The, the, the car was new. The car was yeah. new. I, I only put 30,000 miles on it. The car. Oh, oh that's sad. The oh, that's sad. The peel. I mean, horrible, horrible, horrible. The car was sold for auction at one of these yeah. cheap auctions that just yeah. some cars. I have the photos of the car in that condition. I have to tell you, I cried. I promise you, I cried. I, I feel I, you. I feel I, you. I, I did it. I mean, it just, it was... You it know, was this, and, and this is the thing. This is the thing about cars. It's what I always say is that unlike, you know, unlike a computer, unlike a fridge, unlike, you know, a television set, you know, they're not just an inanimate object, are they? No. They are a living, breathing thing. They have a soul and you develop a connection with them. And the fact that you followed that car through and the fact that somebody then told you what happened to it and the fact that that emotionally impacted you, that's, that's only something cars will do, right? Correct. And I strongly believe it. I know you and I may end up, you know, considered mad, but, but I believe it. I seriously <laughs> believe it. Don't talk bad to your car. I feel like <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I, you know what? I believe that. I absolutely believe that. So I tell you what, before we get on to, you know, your, your, the professional aspect of what you do, one very interesting insight that obviously you have, because, you know, you've operated in the Middle East, in Europe, in the Far East, in America, you know, and so you've been exposed to car culture all around the world. And, you know, going back to, again, the camaraderie of, you know, people like the Land Rover Club and people telling you about what happened to the car is one of the things that I loved about, you know, operating and working in Dubai. And as you know, we used to do these little events and, you know, you'd see the entire mixture of the Dubai community, the diversity of the Dubai community coming together to celebrate cars. But, you know, looking around the world, do you see like a key uh, commonality between car people around the world? Absolutely. Hands down. Absolutely. And this is probably one of the most um, amazing effects of our society today Whilst, you know, cars do have a bad reputation, uh, apparently, yeah. not, I'm not going to go into that subject. But one thing that people tend to forget is how cars have been a catalyst. You know, it, it, take a step back and, and rethink about cars and generally transportation. But cars were a different means of transportation. Transportation used to be, you know, to transport goods, to transport people, but the individuality of cars really turned the process and, and, and the appreciation for, for that object from people. It gave them freedom, freedom to sing, to shout in the car, to be themselves. It was an extension of themselves at some point. I mean, it is, it is no secret that back in, in the early days of cars, um, wealthy owners would custom order a car per their liking, what yeah. they wanted. So you see, right, that, right down to the bodywork being completely exactly. different because in those days they were coach built bodies. So you there basically bought the bodies. chassis and you said what you wanted in terms of the body. Absolutely. So it's that's customization of cars is, is nothing new. And it's what we see today, you know, with, with all the various, um, I would say, sectors of custom built cars is just a logical continuation. Now, the fantastic thing is worldwide, wherever you go, people have or use cars either for transportation or for economical purposes or for pleasure or for, as I said, an extension of themselves. And, and even if you go into remote places of the world, if, if you have you ever been to South America, if you've ever been to India, for instance, you see these transportation vehicles totally customized with colors, with little things hanging, with paintings, with good luck signs. I mean, everywhere you go, that, that, item that object is a catalyst right so at different levels you do have the same passion and ultimately when you put two individuals together it does not matter their finance their background where they come from what their passion is they end up liking the automobile with a capital a and that i think is a really beautiful beautiful thing it is, isn't it? And I know you attended many of our events as well, and I attended some of yours as well. And it was a case of like, the wonderful thing is, you, you know, you'd have you know, Emiratis turning up in G-Wagons, you'd have the Americans turning up in trucks, and you'd have, you know, Filipinos turning up in Honda Civics with stickers on them, you know, and it would just, everybody would just park next to each other. And we'd all just be talking about cars. And it was just incredible. And it was a wonderful unifier. Absolutely. There's no fighting. There is no, my car is better than your car. It's more about, oh, tell me about your car. Oh, how interesting. Oh, I didn't think of this. You know, and, yeah. and 
that exchange is culturally enhancing and mentally enhancing. And it's you know, really it, fantastic. And there's something that you just touched on um, in what you were just saying a few moments ago about car culture around the world. And it's one of the things I often tell people here. All, you know, I, I don't know if you feel the same way as I do, but I think being in Europe, we do get a little bit blinkered and we do tend to think that we own the culture or we own, you know, car enthusiasm or, you know, a passion for cars. What we don't realize is, like you said, go anywhere in the world and you will find a community of people even if it's just decorating their cars or it's a local street racing culture or it's like this weird culture where the Japanese put massive pipes on the back of their cars and stuff. Do you know what I mean? There's always, you know what I mean? But there's always something, isn't there? Always and wherever you go. And actually, if you do travel the world, I advise you to, to those of you who are listening, you know, take the time to look at it and don't expect to see what you see in your own region area. Go explore and you'll be really, really amazed. I mean, I've, I've been fortunate to travel a little bit and um, it's it's outstanding, uh, really outstanding. And even when you don't speak the language, um, I was once doing a recce for a rally for, for the company I used to work for. Um, it's an Asian hotel group, the Peninsula Hotels. And we did this amazing recce. We wanted to do a rally from Bangkok to Hong Kong, which would have been, you know, one of the, you know, things to do in a lifetime. Definitely. Um, and so I, I ended up, my partner and I, we ended up, my business partner, we ended up into the most remote places of China, right? We didn't speak a word of, 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 Mandarin, or, uh, of Mandarin in that case because it was not by the shore. Yet the conversation about cars broke down all the barriers. We know we would see cars on the side of the road. We would stop. There was an old BMW. There was a, what did we see? An old MG. There was a few English cars. I don't know when they were imported, but, but the owner was so incredibly proud to share this. I mean, that is fantastic. Again, it is culturally enhancing and, and mentally enhancing as well. And what about yourself, Matthias? How did you first get into cars? Was it something that was inspired by a parent or a relative, or was it something that was just inherent? That question always comes back. You know what? I can't remember, so it must have been very, 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 very long time ago. Um, I don't remember actually why or how. Um, my father uh, has always told me that I enjoyed cars. I, I since very, very, very little age, like one, two years old. I mean, it was like, boom, boom, you know, I was pointing out to cars. Um, probably, probably I was exposed to cars. Um, my father at the time had two very, very special cars. My father liked cars, but he was not a car collector. He, he's an artist. He's a painter. You see some of his paintings in the background. Um, but he had uh, a 1974 Chevrolet Caprice station wagon. Wow, <laughs> those are cool. So, I, mean, I remember those from my time in Saudi. They're great. They just go on forever. Was it the one with the tailgate and the drop-down window in the back? The, the tailgate that goes like this. Yeah. The shell tailgate. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, that car would cruise 180 kilometers an hour on the highway in 74 when, you know, the French would be driving, you know, Renault Ford. <laughs> <laughs> you have this two and a half. It was, pro it was probably the biggest. The, it was probably the biggest thing on the roads then. It was. It was. I mean, the thing was humongous. It's still humongous. And um, so I think that must have been an element. The second car they, they owned was a Fiat 500 that my mother had bought new in 1960. I'll talk about two extremes. <laughs> Well, <laughs> you could probably put the Fiat 500 into the tailgate to the boot of the Caprice. <laughs> you could put it on the top, or I mean, it would sit sideways. You know, it was probably as wide as long as. So, um, so basically, we had the Fiat uh, to to move around in Paris within the city. So I think these two elements probably played a role, and my father has an incredible story. Now we we still own uh, f two of the three cars I'm listing now. The Chevy ended up. Unfortunately, we had to, to get rid of it because it was rusted out and it was, it was not economical to keep it. Um, I hope one day I can buy one, find one and, and gift it to my father. Oh, that would be awesome. I really like the car. But the other car was a very, very special car, um, which we didn't know about. Or my father didn't really know how special it was. Uh, he exchanged it for paintings. It's a 1952 Rolls Royce. It's a Silver Dawn drop-head coupe. Oh! And... You know, well, yeah, well. It's I mean, nice. I tell you, if he was not into cars, he certainly had a keen eye for them. That's for sure. I mean, that what a <laughs> thing. What a thing to end up with. 
yeah, it was quite, it is, it is very special, very special because actually it's a, it's a one-off since Moliner, who was a coach builder among yeah. the others of, of Rolls Royce at the time, um, designed on a, on a, on a silver dawn, which is a mass produced Rolls Royce, one of mm -hmm. the early mass produced Rolls Royce, if we can say it this way, he designed a drop head coupe. He designed two cars. And of the two cars he designed, one had a standard, uh, it's a four-seater car, you know, with a standard drop-head, uh, drop-down uh, top, you know, with the, the, the lights in the sides, the, the windows on the sides, we call them lights, but the windows. And the one my father ended up having is a unique one because it only has two seats, so it's like a roadster. And it has a differently designed soft top with a Perspex window that runs all the way around the back, which is really, wow. really special. Actually, I have a Corgi model of it, believe it or not. Corgi oh, wow. That's amazing. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. <laughs> and, um, and he had the car and he used it. And then he just stored it one day. The car had a little incident and he stored it. Um, and it never left the storage. It's still there. Oh, my goodness. It's still there. But it's still there since it was parked. Yeah, well, we moved it on uh -huh. a trailer from one storage to another. Right, 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 right. It's not been run or started since 1977. Oh, my goodness. Wow. 1978, I think, something some around those My days. goodness. Um, so what's the plan with that, Matthias? Are you going to get it working and get it, get it out and about? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Now, the plan <laughs> is how to do it. How much do we do in it? And when do we do it? Because that's obviously quite expensive. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a project that I have that I'm working on. Um, and it ultimately will will take place, and I, I would like to do this um, sooner than later. Oh, me. that would be amazing! That'd be absolutely splendid. I tell you what, that'd be I, when you fix that up, I'll come over and we go for a drive in it. That'd be amazing. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely for that. That would be epic. So moving on then. Um, so you, I know you as a big events guy, you know, and you know you've created these incredible, very prestigious, and very high profile events around the world. How did you get into this? And what is it that appeals to you about creating these things, these sort of events? Well, I think it was a mix of two things. Um, one, it's my passion for cars, obviously. Uh, as, a, as a teenager, I wanted to be a car designer. And my father said, no, 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 don't be a car designer. Being an artist is a very difficult job. Be a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> so I went to law school. All right. But I, but I ended up quitting the job because I finished law school, but I ended up quitting the job because of my passion for cars. And you see, when I was a student, it's a, it's a small detail, but it's important to mention. When I was a student, in order to, to be able to continue maintain and run my cars, because for me, that, that was very, very important. Um, my father didn't have much money at the time. And he said, look, I can't help you. Uh, you're on your own. So I worked on the side and ended up working in an events agency. And I discovered something absolutely magical, which is the world of events. Now, this ephemeral moment where you throw your clients into an ambiance into an experience and they they go from their normal living to that experience for a set of time an hour or half an hour and then they come out again they you see them coming out of it changed modified they, they have a different perspective and they're like oh they're or they're relaxed or so the world of events, I thought, was really fascinating. And I decided to pursue a career in, in the world of events, not thinking events cars, but just events in general. Right. Yeah, yeah. Back in Paris, I worked for an agency. We did a lot of uh, product launches for Louis Vuitton. You know, you could imagine the type of events. Mm. It was super yeah. creative, uh, uh, just beautiful, beautiful things. And, and they continue to do them. So I went to, to Boston and I, and I did a master's degree that was in line with events mm. communication. And I was subsequently hired by the Peninsula Hotels, um, not so much because they wanted to do events, but because they owned a property in California called Quail Lodge. And on that property, uh, and the owner, you have to understand that the, the chairman and, and shareholder of the company is a fine collector, um, wanted to develop his own event within the property. And knowing my background and my experience with events and with cars, um, I was uh, I was uh, I was hired by the by the hotel, and this is how uh, there was another lady that had been hired just before me, a very nice lady called Amy. This is how Amy and I started the Quail, basically out of nothing, um, and just a couple of recommendations from the chairman, and uh, and and that was it. And we worked with with the whole hotel team. It was just a fantastic experience. Now, 
one of the things that I, I could be quite proud of is, you know, Carmel, California is a destination for fine cuisine. There's a, there's a, a great trend of, of, uh, of uh, you know, genuine produce and, and, and how do you call them? Uh, in French, we say bio, but I, well, I forgot the name. But like, like organic, organic. Organic, right, right. Fair organic. Okay, yeah. And we were blessed in the hotel to have an extremely talented chef extremely talented, who was able to cook a German meal, an Asian meal, an Italian meal, or an American meal, all at once with, with very, very high level, not something basic. Mm. And I sat with him, his name is Jeff Rogers. And I sat with Jeff and I said, Chef, how about doing something different for this event? Of course, we gather, you know, these car collectors, they're all having a good time. Of course, they have to have a meal. Of course, you're going to make a nice meal. But how about we do something a bit more spicy than this? We have cars from different eras and from different areas in the world. We have Italian cars, we have French cars, we have German cars, we have Asian cars, we have American cars. We should set up a pavilion in each corner of the field featuring the, the foods of that area. Brilliant. He looked at me, he said, you're mad, but I love your madness. <laughs> Yeah, that's, and, that's what drives us. We gotta be mad, <laughs> and uh, and we did it. And I think I think that element really set the quail apart um, because it was always from the beginning a culinary event showcasing you know these incredible automobiles. Because incredible aut automobiles, you know, the, I would say the best ones were shown at Pebble Beach, and yeah. you can't beat Pebble Beach. Pebble Beach is the number one event. In yeah, that I mean, it's just outstanding on every level and um and we're not trying to compete by all means we just tried to you know focus on something a bit different so we focused on sports and race cars only which yeah. were really at the time this is 2003 um were not featured at major concours yeah because the concours was you know for the traditional body lines and so that's on. right that's right i think i mean back then it was only really goodwood that was doing that sort of thing exactly yeah exactly so, so we decided to do that event with, with a twist, sports and race cars, but mostly hospitality. At the end of the day, it was a, it was a great event for the hotel company to showcase what, they're allowed, what, I, what they are able to do. And, uh, and I'm really, really proud of the team uh, of Courtney, who was an employee that I hired, uh, that I showed and trained and, and brought up to become the director of the event and extremely proud of her because she's still there. And she brought the event with the rest of the team, obviously, just to something at another level. If you've never been, do me a favor, go. Um, it is something special. When you when you look about when you think about that event, and when you think about what you're working on at the moment uh, on on the current concord that you do, what's the sort of you know if you were to try and pin down the golden element? I mean, in that case, you employed the the sort of novelty of food from different parts of the world. But if you were to say, what is, the, what is the element that brings these things together? And I have my own opinion on this as well. What do you think makes for a good event? Because it's, it's not just the cars, is it? I mean, cars, the cars are fundamental. They're an important part of it. Yeah. But it's not just the cars, is it? You know, it's, it's a good question. I think it's also a, an adaptation to the local culture, right? Because a good event in the U.S., is not the same as a good event in Europe or a good event in Asia or the Middle East, as we've seen and experienced. Yeah. Um, and I think what makes a good event is the understanding of what the local culture expects, right? Because otherwise you're just trying to, to make two things that don't meet. Um, ultimately, and this is why it comes down to, yes, the cars do make a good event. When it, when, we're talking about car events, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. car events, absolutely, yeah. Oh, because yeah. with, and, okay. this is all about cars. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The list is long. Yeah. Um, so I would really say understanding that, that element so you can deliver it to the audience um, is probably what makes a good event. After that, you have the hospitality, you have the creativity, you have a different factor. You, have, you always get the wow factor. You get the different C factor. Um, and, and as an event organizer, you have to think about it. You have to think... What will make my event different? What, what is, you know, in marketing, we talk about USP, the unique, unique selling point. Yeah. And that is very, very key in an event because you can't be just replicating somebody else's event or just another event. Um, that's not the point. The point is really to showcase something different, like an artist. You know, how am I expressing my, my art differently? 
I think that's a very, very valid point. And I think particularly what you said about the cultural aspects of it is very, very important. Uh, and and as, a, as a sort of expanding on your point a little bit further, because I actually wrote about it in the current issue uh, about events, because I, you know, after, after the pandemic, it was wonderful to be able to get out and to go to events and all of this sort of stuff. And I think one of the key things that sort of um, uh, that I took away from that that I was so relieved to to that, that that sort of corroborated my belief in these in these sort of things, is that it's yes, it's about the cars, and absolutely it's about the culture, but I think first and foremost it's about the people, you know, and that's one of the things that I learned is like you know because you go to these events, and when you go to an event, you make friendships, you find out certain things, you learn stuff that you never knew. You you, you I found a guy that bought a Bentley because he wanted to talk about mental health. I mean, there was, you know, you normally you would never think about that. But the more I spoke to him, the more I like, yeah, this makes perfect sense, you know. And you you start and you develop these relationships. I mean, you know, we develop these friendships like you and I have, you know. And I think that that to me is a fundamental thing. And I think one of the things that's very important for people to remember is that the cars are extraordinary, but it's the people that make the cars. Because it's the people that give the cars a story. And it's the people that basically animate that car and give it a reason for existence. And I think that's fundamental. But I think what you've touched on is incredible. Because what you've actually identified is the fact that that story, that story of that interpersonal relationship between the human and the, and the vehicle is different all around the world, isn't it? Completely. Completely. And you're, you're absolutely right by, by saying the people are, are the, the, the key element. In fact, um, they are the only important part. Uh, obviously, when I talked about successful adaptation is also to, to adapt to the local people. But what is fascinating is this is why we, we touched on it early in the, in the show. Travel the world, go to the various events, and you will listen to incredible stories. You'll see how every single person has a story to tell and an attachment to that car. And this is what makes it very rich. It is, it is, otherwise it's just an inanimated object. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's like a table, you know, it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a rock. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so you're absolutely right, uh, Shazad, to, to mention this. And I think um, we see, I would like to highlight this. We see it when you go to an event and, you know, you, you can be a bit shy and you see all these really beautiful cars or just simple cars. People tend to be a bit shy, you know, and they look at them and they... And then you have the owner standing around them. Yeah. Let me give you a piece of advice, everyone. Do not be shy. You yes. see the car, you see an owner, you go straight to him and say, yes. good morning, sir. Good morning, madam. Tell me about your car because yeah. I like your car. That's why I'm looking at it. So yeah. imagine if you come to me and you're looking at my car, obviously you have an interest in my car. We have something in common. Let's talk. <laughs> and, and, cool. and, and, and this is the, and you're absolutely right. And one, one thing that people who are shy, what they don't realize is that anybody that's taken the time and the effort to clean and polish and detail the car and bring it to an event and stand next to it is keen to talk about it because that's why they're there. That's their favorite subject, you know? Maybe, maybe sometimes too much. So, so <laughs> sometimes too much. <laughs> No, yeah, sometimes no. you have to know when, to, okay, yeah, all right, now you're just getting geeky and anoraki. All right, let's move on. You know, we don't need to talk chassis numbers. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, but, but I know what you mean. But normally, just, but even if you're not interested in what they're saying, but just to be able to enjoy the aura of the passion and the enthusiasm that somebody displays for their pride and joy, you, you soak that up. And it's like what you said earlier about, you know, you, somebody goes to an event and they leave the event changed. Changed. They do. Maybe. You know, one one day, um, uh, Tom Bryant, the, the editor uh, who, who passed away uh, of Road and Track, uh, Tom Bryant was a fantastic uh, journalist. And I was privileged to be interviewed by him, not because of me, Matthias, but because I was directing the quail. And he asked me, and he said, Matthias, what is your favorite thing about an event? And I said, people smiles. Yes. Because, because they come to the event, they're already happy, huh, usually. They don't come unhappy. Huh? <laughs> I don't know I'm going to go to this event and be miserable today. I'm going to go to the doctor for that. I'll come to events. But basically, they come happy, and then they, they are in awe. And this is the magic of events that we talked about earlier. It's just to make people happier. And, and the fantastic thing with car events is you have that symbiosis immediately. You can go to, to, to an art exhibit. It's fabulous. But it's less likely that the art will speak to you than yeah. the cars end up speaking to you because we it's it's much more accessible. We all relate mm. to cars. Um, yeah. I'm not putting them on a comparison. I'm just saying it is perhaps more accessible. 
And therefore, if you go to an event of car event, doesn't matter what it is. I can be a, a small gathering, cars and coffee, or something major. Yeah. Uh, in London, you have some of the world's best concourse, by the way, which I recommend people do go. Please do go because it is what you'll see. You'll never see otherwise. So, yeah. so you see them in the flesh. You can access them. You know, you don't have ropes and barriers. It's not like the motor show where, you know, are you invited? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'm not and, and, and actually, and picking up on that point, because that's very good, because it's a good segue to where I wanted to go next, actually, is the evolution of car shows and car events. And I know that you and I privately, we've spoken about this a little bit, but, you know, we have seen this kind of, um, I wouldn't say demise, but certainly a decline of sort of the traditional motor show has sort of started to happen over the last few years. But conversely, on the other side, the events that we were talking about, like the Concourse events, the Pebble Beach, the Quail, the Goodwoods, these things have actually grown and got bigger. Do we see a shift that's happening in the world of automotive events? You, you know, I think so. I think we do see a shift <clears throat> or perhaps... And and this is an open conversation. I, I'm not sure if I if I if I have the if I can speak the truth, but I see a shift just like you, or maybe I see a deviation of the motor shows into something that was completely off from the original objective. And at the end, car manufacturers and people who like cars they don't want to deviate into something which doesn't relate to them, so they end up sticking to what speaks to them, right? So in our case, I think we're very fortunate because um, the, 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 the Concours, <clears throat> of course, the Concours is the historical part of it, but a Concours is a perfect setting for a brand. It doesn't necessarily have to be a luxurious brand, huh, by the way, but for a brand to really engage directly with their audience. It is the one time where you can meet with them, mingle with them, show your product, talk about the product, tell the story, which ultimately in a car show, you couldn't really say because first, there is so much noise around. It's, yeah. it's so big, it's so crowded um, that somehow I think the message was lost. And I don't know. I mean, I think also that the, there is an evolution in, in communication uh, avenues. There is more digital nowadays. Um, back in the days, it was, you know, you go to a car show because that's the only place where you could yeah. see the new cars. Today, you can see the new cars in 3D. You can, you can see them all over the web. So you don't really need to go to a car show to go inside yeah. the car because you can yeah. literally go inside. Yeah. However, however, we come down to the senses. And I think nothing will change the fact that when you can touch a car, you can get a feeling. When you can see it with your eyes, there's a different perspective. And that's where I think we in the Concours being able to offer this to our, to our exhibitors um, have an advantage, yes. You know, you said something there that made me think about car shows or made me think of an aspect of car shows that I hadn't actually thought about before. And I think you, you really sort of sparked my imagination there because something that you said there about the noise of a traditional motor show. And of course, what that relates to, I mean, obviously there's A, there's the actual noise, which liter the literary interpretation, but there's also the hype in terms of noise, right? And there's a marketing noise. And I think that that's actually quite, there's something to be said there because with motor shows, what you do get is you get marketing hype. You get a controlled messaging that's happening because the manufacturers are trying to sell you cars. But at car events like concours and like, you know, other car shows and club events and stuff like that, there isn't any of that. There isn't any of the BS, if you like, because everything there is authentic because sure. the passion and the enthusiasm and the ownership, you know, the owner of a Range Rover, will tell you that, yes, he's, he's not going to say, oh, this car never leaks. He's like, yeah, it leaks, and but this is the solution, and this is what I've done to fix it. You know, the manufacturer will be like, no, our cars never leak. Our cars never do this. You know, they're perfect, you know. So I think that, that, that that's a fundamental difference, which, to be honest, I've only just realized right now, but an epiphany, that's an amazing thing. It's true. It's, it is a big difference. And the fact that we are hands down, hands on it, you know, we, we are in contact with the product. Um, as you said, the noise is not so much the noise of, of the ambiance noise. Yeah. It is the, the aggressivity of the messages that come to you. And when there's too much, your body shuts down. Yeah. You just shut down. You just yeah. you can't take it. You yeah. know, it's funny. You, you mentioned this. Um, I saw a post on Instagram of a friend recently. There's a, an event in Dubai called, I think it's called CTEX, something like this, right? Yes, now. I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she posted this image of this concept car Mercedes in a show in a stand 
where you had so so literally I, I wish i could show it to you here on the screen but the floor is led screens the right. walls are led screens the freaking ceiling is led screens you yeah. it's just like blade runner yeah and i wrote to her and i said is are we is blade is, i mean are we there yeah <laughs> because if that's the future no i don't want it yeah. you realize you know you could see the, the 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 humans walking around the stand she was just taping it with yeah. the camera you could see that they were like, like zombies, like, yeah. like, like <laughs> hey, cool, wow, yeah. oh my god, I don't know, yeah. it's like, this is madness. Yeah, yeah. It's madness. I think, I think there we've yeah. gone a little too far. Yeah. Um, but you know what? Yeah. Human will survive and will will end up coming back to. Oh, we will, we will. I mean, there's, a, I mean, you know, there's a difference, isn't there? Because that aspect of what you've just described there, that's the woe factor. But the, the other thing that we're talking about is the authenticity. And I think one of the things that social media has done, actually, is actually encourage us to go. This is why, like somebody said to me the other day, is like, oh, do you make up posts? And do you do? I'm like, no, no, I, I talk genuinely to my audience because I think the audience, A, they will recognize if you're not being authentic. And B, they appreciate your honesty. And I think that's what it's about. So anyway, moving on and kind of trying to bring this to a wrap up sort of thing. Um, the world of classic cars. Because as you, and you touched on this earlier in this conversation, you know, the, the, the world of cars, the world that, that we live in, the world that we embody, which is the enthusiasm for everything automotive, automotive, is under pressure. It's under threat a little bit, you know, because of the, and you know, to be fair, the climate issues need to be addressed and we need to do something about it. But what do you see as the future for a car enthusiasm, but be particularly classic cars? Do you think that because some people said to me, oh, after 2030. So, for example, in the UK, 2030 is a cutoff point for selling petrol diesel uh, cars in the market. Some people say, oh, well, classic cars will become worthless after that. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. I think the, quite the contrary is going to happen. It, I don't have a crystal ball, Shazad. Um, yeah. And I would not have the, the, the I'd say the the. I would say la prétention, the, you know, pretend that I would know the future. Um, but here is here's what I th I'd like to, to throw out there. First of all, I think this is um, a, 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 the wrong uh, target. When when people talk about ch climate change and they say, "Oh, the classic cars," you're talking about the the point of the needle, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, it's like it's like point zero 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 something percent, you know means nothing now classic cars versus classic car what is a classic car you know is any voxel rusty with a broken engine from the the 90s is that a classic car uh, what makes a classic car what is worth keeping at all costs and what is not necessarily worth keeping at all costs then there's another conversation um people might be surprised but i really like the car i i actually drive on a regular basis an old renault twingo right it's a fantastic car it's got yeah. plenty of room and I bought it for very little money and I yeah. enjoy driving it around. That's perfect for the city. Very, very little consumption. Yeah. Now, the, the, the environmental impact of recycling that car and buying a new one that has been engineered versus keeping that car, I think the environmental impact is much worse if you buy a new car. So, yeah. but I don't have the facts and figures, but these are things that are walk, being walked around. So to say, get rid of the classic cars is a bit of a, of a quick wrong solution. To the environmental impact now to do nothing is also wrong and and yes i think you know petrol has to be to be rethink rethought uh, because it is not a good source of energy um and in that sense i think there is already because i've been speaking when i was a judge at the zoot conco in belgium I was speaking to an engineer who said no you know we can run any classic car on ethanol for mm -hmm. example we can do it and I think we are that close. Well, Prince Charles just recently revealed that his 50-year-old Aston is running on English wine. So it's like, you know, <laughs> he's, I don't know what he is, wine and cheese. I don't know how he's figured that out. But And Aston Martin had said apparently he was running better on that anyway. So <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. But, so basically, there are alternative sources of energies, petrol or, or such as hydrogen, for instance, which no one speaks about. We all talk about yeah. electricity. Well, funnily enough, this weekend, there's a big uh, problem here in Switzerland because they've announced that we have an electricity shortage. Yes. Thank you. And the next 10 years will be a serious problem. We're oh, great. Discussion on the public news about going back to nuclear power. Yeah. So, so, but for the classic cars, um, no, I don't think they'll end up uh, being worthless and stored. I think they will continue to be used because 
we have that attachment in them uh, because they're part of the, our history, they're part of our heritage. And I would really urge people to actually continue to influence governments about it, to think about it. Dumping the classic cars is not the solution to your climate problem. And that's all. So don't use that. Uh, education is the, the, the solution and educating classic car owners to properly use their classic cars, to properly maintain their classic cars and to have that choice of this I keep, but this we don't need to keep is I think what needs to go to the future. One thing I want to touch about is, is the, the alternative solution of energy with electricity and classic cars. Um, and I've seen, you know, not pointing the finger to anyone here, but let me ask you a question just, just for a second. What does a Ferrari sound like? <laughs> it sounds like heaven in the automotive world. I'll tell you that much. And, that and full if, you have, if you have children, and if you remember in your childhood, you probably turned your head to the sound yeah. of the car. Yeah. Right? And now we are suggesting, oh, let's turn them silent. Yeah. You know, it's it's like, you know, we were talking about the James Bond car, which is yeah. which is proposed as an electric car. Well, I advise you all, you go see a James Bond movie on mute. Yeah. <laughs> that's what it sounds like. Yeah. 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 I know. It's that. That's a, I mean, let's not get into that right now, because that's a whole other topic about converting uh, classic cars into electric. But in a nutshell, the way I feel about it is that it's sacrilege if the car has a working and viable engine. Yes. But if you're restoring something that's pretty much dead and the engine is already dead and you go, well, you know what, let's do something different with it. I'm OK with that. I'm OK with that. But like, for example, there's a company here that took the engine out of a Ferrari. Since you mentioned Ferrari, they took the engine out of a Ferrari and they put an electric motor in there. And, they, and, they, and, they, and, they, and their, their excuse was that, well, you can all, it can always be you know, reverted back. And I'm like, well, yeah, but why? Why have you done that? You know? <laughs> well, you're, you're taking away one of the key senses of a car. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and I think <clears throat> what makes people appreciate a car is obviously the line, the design, the yeah. of it, okay? The, the feeling of driving it. And in that comes another sense, which is the hearing sense. That's it. It is no secret that car manufacturers have invested tons of money into the sound of cars. You know, the doors. Yeah, the exactly, cars, yeah. And the exhaust pipe. Yeah. The exhaust pipe is not just exhaust out. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no. It's a very well thought about system that creates a specific sound. This is, this is how cars create their own identity. Mm. So, so just taking off the engine and replacing it with an electric engine, I don't know. It's to me, yeah, it's just like, okay, scotch tape. Yeah. Well, you're a beautiful person, but you can't speak. Well, <laughs> losing 50% of you. Imagine Shavad. I mean, you're, you're a great, you're a fantastic soul. You're, you're, you're radiant. Imagine that you had you couldn't speak anymore. <laughs> That'd be the end of me, that's for sure. But thank you for saying that. I appreciate what? it. Anyway, on that wonderful, I think I should I should quit while I'm ahead because that was a very nice thing to say. But anyway, but just to let people know, what are you up to next, and where can they find you if they want to get in touch with you? Well, very simple. We are preparing next year's Concours d'Elegance in June 18 to 20th in Switzerland. It's a historic Concours, one of the actually the oldest Concours in Europe in activity now. Um, so you can find me there and you can find me on concoursdelegantsuisse.com or you can find us on Instagram at concoursdelegantsuisse and uh, follow us and you'll find all the information about the Concours and the other rallies that we organize. And it's also, where is it? Project Automobile. Uh, is that .com? Projectautomobile.com is my company in, indeed. And you can also go on it. It's just a landing page, but it will send you back to send me an email at project, uh, it's simple, it's info at project uh, projecta.ae because I still run the .ae address, actually. Excellent. Oh, I still got the, the link to the old uh, UAE. Oh, brilliant, oh, brilliant. Yeah, Matthias, mate, it has been absolutely wonderful to catch up with you again on this uh, this format and, and doing this podcast. I can't wait to meet you. I'm sure that's going to happen pretty soon now that we can all travel again, but I can't wait to, to, to give you a good old hug as well, you know, because it's absolutely been wonderful to chat to you today. Thank you so much for doing this and uh, catch you again soon, Matthias. Thank you, Salah. See you soon. Take care. Bye, everyone. A big thank you to my top tier patron and sponsor, Jay Williams over Air Technic. Check out their shop for brakes, exhaust, body kits, and of course, 
suspension. Plus, thanks to Muhammad Ali Omed and Tom Conway Gordon, who are both tier four patrons. And of course, all of these guys for also subscribing to my Patreon account and contributing so much towards helping me to continue creating this content. Join them over at patreon.com forward slash brown car guy. And of course, make sure that you are subscribing, liking and sharing this channel. Hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any of my videos. And also check out browncarguy.com and follow me on all social media channels. Just search for my hashtag, which of course is hashtag brown car guy.